Hi everyone, it's Sam, NFT Statistics, and this is your Proof Daily NFT Countdown. A lot to talk about today. Obviously, the big news is that OpenSea announced that they are basically going to 0% enforced royalties. There's a lot of detail there. To be honest, I think this story kind of played out six months ago, and this is just what I'd call an unfortunate last step to it. But there's a lot of data that I'll show you about kind of what led to this moment and what we've seen so far. Also going to talk about this Rec League Mint, a couple art sales. Let's get right into it. Starting off with a quick market overview. ETH volumes were up a fair bit. Not exactly sure this is the good kind of volume. If you look at prices, someone in my Twitter said uh, that the blur screen looks like an ICU right now. Uh, you can see pretty much everything just down bad with the exception of D-Gods, which is having a little bit of a bump higher. Uh, in terms of where the volume is concentrated, you can see it's almost all been D-Gods at 3,600 ETH the volume, Board API Club, Mutant API Club. Uh, and then after that, nothing doing more than 350 ETH of volume. In terms of where the market share is, vast majority of the market share on Blur, almost 80%. Uh, so the high end of the range where Blur has been. And then in terms of prices, looking in ETH terms, uh, you can see we're down pretty bad. We're back below the level that we were at after Elementals. And some people don't remember this, but Elementals was a full out kind of, even though it was really Azuki that got hit the hardest, Board Apes, D got so many different projects really got hit. We had a nice little bounce back, but now we're back below those levels. Now you got to look at markets in terms of US dollars, I think, to get the full picture. As everyone knows, we had a bit of a flash crash uh, in ETH and Bitcoin and a lot of the currencies, ApeCoin down bad, Blur token down bad. Uh, but you know, we are, even even with the rebound that we got in ETH prices, still ETH down pretty bad over the past 24 hours, kind of settling in that 1650 range versus 1800 the day before. Uh, and in US dollars, this chart looks even worse than it does in ETH terms. Uh, you know, again, in terms of who is up, who is down, a little strength in D gods, a lot of weakness in Moonbirds, Codas, Doodles, Midcap Index, also down a fair bit. Uh, with weakness in Compi Pandas, which had been a bit strong and is giving a little bit of that back after a recent mint they did on Solana. I wanted to look at trade returns. Uh, something you know, I, I like to look at is how are people who buy NFTs via bids, what are the realized gains on those returns? And what you can see is yesterday, the realized returns were down 1,000 ETH. So a very weak day for people buying NFTs via bids, You know, in many cases, flipping them, just more and more trader losses accruing. If you look at total returns year to date, of people who bought NFTs via bids, it is down over 50,000 ETH. Now, there are a couple situations where this will capture the returns, not just of the bidder, but also of someone else, like if they sold it to someone else over the counter uh, and that wasn't a recorded transaction and that, that next person sells it. There are a couple situations here where other people's p gets gets brought, brought in a little bit, but overall, these are losses that the community has taken and it's gotten pretty intense. In terms of art projects, it was kind of a Tyler Hobbs day. There was an incomplete control. There was also a Fidenza sale, which I'll show you, which my screen didn't capture, and a QQL. So a lot of Tyler Hobbs trades. Let's have a look at them. This Fidenza sold for 60 ETH. It's a jumbo. And there's kind of been a buyer who's been out buying a bunch of jumbo Fidenzas. And that was the buyer here. We had an incomplete control, which sold for 30 ETH. And here's a QQL, kind of interesting one, which sold for 3.2. So below the floor there. And then a bold squiggle sold for 29 ETH. We had a bold sell in the teens. So bolts have kind of been a bit all over the place, but very cool squiggle there and very nice sale. Second thing to talk about, OpenSea announces that they're going to be removing royalties. Now they had already removed royalties down to a half of 1% minimum. And what they're saying here is that they're going to go from half of 1% down to 0%. They also had a premise where if you blocked other marketplace exchanges, or if you blocked other exchanges, but enforce royalties on OpenSea and enforce royalties on Blur, that they would enforce royalties in those scenarios. We saw Captains do it. We saw Heavy Metal do it. It actually worked pretty well, but OpenSea came out and said that that is not working anymore and that they are going to kind of take, they are not going to put anyone else uh, on that enforced royalty schedule. And people who do uh, have that already in place. So the captains of the world, the heavy metals of the world that are enforcing royalties as is, they're going to continue to enforce royalties until February 29th of 2024. So that will continue. They're just not adding anyone new to that list. Here is the tweet from OpenSea, a bit of a thread. And I think, I think there's just a lot of details here that was a little bit confusing. Uh, so just kind of repeating a little bit of what I've said. All new projects going forward have no more enforced royalties. Most projects will be going from half of one to 0%, but the projects that currently have enforced royalties 
I'm Blur and OpenSea captains, Heavy Metal, Cyber Kongs, Gen Guy are going to go to 0% in March of 2024. So they do have another six months uh, where the royalties will be enforced. Let's look at the backdrop here, though. Enough of me talking uh, about kind of all these different intricacies. Let's look at the data, starting off with the backdrop. You can see that OpenSea was at 6% for a long time. You know, the average, and this is just the average royalty paid across different platforms. Uh, yeah, and it was really in February that they moved from 6% to half of 1% minimum. Now, what you can also see here is two different things I want to point out. First of all, is that Blur, when OpenSea was at 6.5%, that Blur that entire time was kind of in that 0 to 2% range. So at royalty is about 5% lower. Also, Blur was not charging marketplace fees and OpenSea was. And that period was when when, when Blur or when OpenSea went from like 80% share, Amara, you basically a monopoly to down about 20, 25% share. I showed earlier, you know, how Blur had 80% market share. It was that that real transition happened during this period uh, when OpenSea basically was enforcing royalties, but no one else was. And I think OpenSea has basically said, we can't get caught doing that anymore. We're losing our relevance uh, and we need to keep up if royalties keep going lower. The other thing I want to show you is this green line, which is looks rare. And what you can see is, is basically in April, looks rare, went to 0% royalties. And while that didn't have a huge impact on the market because they don't have a ton of market share, it did create a lot of fear. You saw Blur sometimes going to 0% royalties on projects that were heavily traded on looks rare or X2Y2. It just created more concern that anybody who wanted to could go to 0% royalty and made, I think, OpenSea realize that their filter wasn't actually going to work. They did it by using Seaport, which allows them to get around that filter. Now, if you look at the projects where 0% royalties have happened over the past week, there's been 560 60 per, 560 eat the volume on Mune Pia Club at 0% royalty. 365 of other deed at 0% royalty. Azuki, 240 eat the volume. So we are seeing a fair bit of volume on Lux Rare at 0% royalty, which is kind of making the other exchanges think twice a little bit. The other thing I wanted to show is this operator filter idea, uh, which is basically that projects that enforce and, and block other exchanges and have new contracts will get enforced, that it is actually working. And this is blur royalties over the past seven days. You can see Nakamigos at 5%, Heavy Metal, Sprato Gremlins. The enforcement actually is working, Captains and Potatoes at 3.3%. Uh, so that has been working, but still, yeah, I think OpenSea just said this isn't really a long-term sustainable solution. The other thing that's happened is that kind of as a backdoor to allow people uh, to pay 0% royalty on the big projects, Blur has allowed anyone who sends an NFT, who sells an NFT from the Blend wallet. So if your NFT is held in the Blend wallet and you sell it, even if you're selling a board ape for 27 ETH, uh, but you only take one ETH of a loan out, if you sell that NFT, it will always default to 0% royalty. So the result is that a lot of the projects that use Blend, you know, you've seen a lot of the selling take advantage of this feature. On Azuki, you know, the royalties are half of the minimum. On Board Ape Yacht Club, it's almost zero. On Board Ape Kennel Club, Mutant Ape Yacht Club, you know, it's it's 80% lower than the minimum of, of one half of 1%. So I imagine OpenSea seeing this and just saying, again, this whole system just doesn't seem to be working very well. What this looks at is Board Ape Yacht Club's average royalties over the past few months uh, on Blur. And you can see that it really kind of held at that half of 1% in the beginning. But once blend started happening, it started to torpedo downward. And right now it's almost at 0%. And then that's for other reasons. That I, along with the blend wallet, it also seems that you know, for, for some technicality, uh, Board Ape Yacht Club has gone to 0%. So overall, this is a long way of saying that this change, I feel, had kind of already happened in the marketplace. This is nothing new. It's OpenSea just saying we can't kind of lag behind like we did at the end of 2022 when we lost all market share. The other thing I want to say is this does not mean that royalties are entirely over. Now, I think on a lot of PFP projects, people pay the minimum. But if you actually look at art blocks, you know, ever since the, the minimum royalty got down to half of 1%, you've still seen an average of over 2% royalties. So people are opting into royalties a fair bit. This what I call tip jar model has worked decently well. Obviously, no one's paying the 7.5% or it's very rare. We are seeing a few people uh, who are opting in. And as a result, the, you know, it doesn't mean that royalties are necessarily over entirely, but obviously not a good thing for royalties. Third thing to talk about, Rec League does their mint and doesn't really mint out. Let's look real quickly at it. Here is a tweet from Rec League. Basically, once they realized that it wasn't going to mint out, they said, uh, you know, anyone can buy unlimited amount right now and that anything that doesn't mint out, they were going to burn. Remember, Rec League was a game that was made outside of the Yuga ecosystem. It's kind of like a fighting game, but they're giving people in the Yuga ecosystem the opportunity to mint uh, collectibles, and not, or not even collectibles, like utility-filled uh, crates and weapons and things like that for the game. 
uh, and this was the first opportunity to do so. Over 200,000 wallets submitted KYC for the Mint. Pretty crazy number there. The price was 150 APE, which is 0.14 ETH or $235. So far, about 8,600 have sold out of the 25,000. You know, even though that's not filling out the 25,000, it still is more than $2 million uh, that they have raised. Which in this environment, in this environment where NFT NFT holders are down 2.2 billion dollars in the past six months, raising two million dollars is no small feat. So still a decent fundraise, a decent amount of money raised, even though it didn't quite hit their targets. They said the remainders will be burned. There also will be mints in the future for Munapes, Board Ape Kennel Club, as well as Board Ape Yakub holders, uh, where they will get. I think I think in most cases a free kit, which will give them access to this game. Uh, they had majestic boxes as well as booster boxes. What the majestic boxes did was make it more likely that you're going to get legendary traits uh, and some of the better traits in the different things uh, that you mint. Here you can see each box, each majestic box, come with ten things. We'll call them the head, the crest, the legs, the torso. Maybe it's not a weapon, but all sorts of other aspects that come with that box. And then here's a bit of a roadmap. The traits are going to be revealed on August 24th, so in about a week. And then here is the, I'm, I'm just giving you all the pictures that they showed us, but here's basically kind of the list of the different rarities saying Yuga is the absolute top tier. And again, the Majestic boxes are the ones that have the best chance of getting that. So we'll see how this plays out. Very curious. So again, I think $2 million is a fair bit to raise for a game that hasn't started yet. So, you know, maybe over time, you know, people want to upgrade more once they start playing, who knows, uh, but we will see how that all plays out. Lastly, let's talk about a few notable sales. First, this trade between my very good friend, Cyrus, had him on the podcast, and the CEO of my company, Proof, Kevin Rose. Really interesting trade. Cyrus had a glitch Moonbird. I believe he, he probably got it from a loan. I'm not entirely sure. My guess is it was from a defaulted loan. Uh, but that could be wrong. Sorry, Cyrus, if that is wrong. Uh, but this this is is kind of a very rare Moonbird. I think there are only four of them, somewhere between four and ten, I believe. And he traded that in exchange for two Moonbirds, uh, one Chromie Squiggle, four Mythics, and then another four ETH. If you add it all up, yeah, you know, maybe this the Squiggles were ten and the Moonbirds, you know, one and a half, uh, and the Mythics point uh, three, and then four ETH. You know, looking at the high teens for this. So interesting trade to see that go through. Uh, here are, you know, when you're looking at what rare Moonbirds have traded at, you know, the most recent ones have been at 17, 27, 28, 30, not very liquid. A few of these go back many months. So uh, this trade from Cyrus was kind of uh, receiving an amount sort of similar to that 17 ETH number. Uh, as far as other uh, big trades, an Opepin edition one, that first edition of art, this is a one of 20 from that sold for 17.8 ETH. Remember, there are only 80 NFTs in that first edition of Opepin. So really kind of the grail of the grails when it comes to Opepin edition. If you look at the prior sales from this edition one, you can see they've been at 25.70, 23, 15.5, and 21.7. So this kind of at the low end of the range, but still a really nice price for that Opepin. In terms of one of one sales, this piece, Dream Study by Molly McCutcheon, sold for three ETH to Bob Lucas. Now, interestingly, she sold another piece uh, to Bob Lucas, also for three ETH. One was sold on Super, or the other on Manifold, but this one uh, was called As Above, So Below, also by Molly McCutcheon. A little bit about Molly, she is a fine artist exploring charcoal and ink, also was a Division I women's basketball player at the University of South Carolina Upstate, graduating in 2022, public speaker, social media, marketing, strategy, management management and brand development. Very cool. A little bit of a different profile from what we see in a lot of the, the artists in the space. So love to see that. Congrats to Molly on the sale. Here she is saying another piece lands with Bob Lucas, thanking her buyer uh, when that piece sold for three ETH. In terms of her other sales, she's had a handful of sales at three ETH or higher. Uh, and I saw in an interview that basically what she does is she takes the art and scans it. And it's kind of a direct replica of the piece that she creates. And what you can see here, again, a bunch of sales above three ETH. One more sale to talk about called The Perfect American by Bingo. This one sold for 3.5 ETH. The buyer, MG Data, 007. Pretty cool piece here. In terms of the description, he says this is a surrealist triptych exploring the fever, dr the fever dream of mid-century pop Americana created through a unique process of digital painting using AI designed brushes formed out of a neural network trained in 1920s era advertisements, war propaganda, and very early Disney animation sketches. So you can kind of get a feel for that, you know, how that AI model was changed and how it turned out. Very cool stuff. That's all for me today. I hope you like the show. I hope you have a really good weekend. We'll be back on Monday with another show. Give us a like below. Tell us what you think in the comments and subscribe to the channel. And we'll talk to you soon. Have a great week.